Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I want to thank the Stone Tower Church for this privilege to be here with you this week. I have to tell you that <clears throat> uh, this was a, a welcome break for me. Some of you may know I've been working for the Oklahoma Conference as their evangelist, and in some ways, we get to preach the same sermons over and over and over again. <laughs> And uh, it's been a pleasure just sharing with you this week as we've meditated on the life of Christ. Today, I'm sharing something with you that I typically present during my evangelistic series, but I thought it would be appropriate given that we are looking this week at the closing scenes of the life of Jesus. Now, with your permission, I'm going to tell a story to you today, but the story is more than just a historical truth. I want to share this story with you because the details of this story, they illustrate the importance of making a wise decision at the right time. And so today I I share this story with you. It's from Scripture, but to introduce it to you this morning, I want to give you a little bit of background. Um, Our story takes place almost 2,000 years ago, and it originates in the country of Spain. At that time, the Roman Empire ruled that part of the world, and a family gave birth to a son. And this family, as uh, as they raised this child, there's almost nothing said about him in his earliest years. But what we do know is that when he reached an age where he could be used as a soldier, he was conscripted, he was forced to serve in the Roman legions. Now, at that time, um, we don't have a lot of information, but what we do know is that he distinguished himself as a remarkable, brave soldier. And as time went on, the acts of heroism and bravery, they began to reach the ears of his superiors and their superiors. It reached a point that ultimately even Caesar, all the way in Rome, heard about the military prowess of this individual. And so, as a gift and perhaps as a reward for his devotion and his courage, he was given the greatest gift that a slave at that time could be given. He was offered his freedom. And with this newfound freedom, he continued to rise in rank in the army until he reached the status of a general. Now, in those days, that was quite an exalted position. And as he became a general, now he was in a position where he could lead the very armies that he was once part of. And as he led those armies again and time and time again, he was victorious. In those days, when generals returned from battle to Rome, they offered them like somewhat of like a parade. We would call it a parade today. Uh, If you had a really decisive victory, they'd even build you like an arch. Uh, But he was was honored with these uh, these, uh, parades, and as he came into the city, they usually ended at a special area where Caesar was waiting to bestow what looked like a crown made of leaves, a laurel wreath upon his head. History tells us that on one of these occasions, as an act of deference and loyalty to the Caesar, he took it off and he placed it at the very feet of Caesar. We are told that he understood that his life in this type of career, he knew would only be short-lived. I mean, there was definitely a Uh, a a, a date of expiration, you might say, for the life of a general. And so he began to look for other opportunities by which he could enjoy the privileges of the upper class of Roman society. And one day he discovered the answer. Caesar, at the time, had a young daughter. When I say young, she was 13. 
He was in his 30s by now. And what we do know is that he asked for her hand in marriage. And history says that Caesar granted him his request. For their wedding, as a gift, Caesar gave him the privilege to be the governor of one portion of the Roman Empire. And that's what he wanted. That's what he was looking for. He wanted to live out the rest of his time as being part of the ruling elite of Rome. Now, he didn't know it at the time. He didn't know it at that particular point that what he got wasn't much of a gift. This particular part of the Roman Empire, it was just rife with insurrection and rebellion. The people were notoriously difficult to govern. And he found this out very quickly. In those days when a Roman official traveled, they had this like entourage, you know, and they traveled. And as he came into the city, perhaps on his inaugural entrance, uh, they had these standards that the Romans traveled with. And the standard usually had like some insignia, but it usually also had the, like the, the depiction, like a bust of the Caesar of the time. And for some reason, these people found some issue with that particular thing. They became crazy. Like they went into a, uh, into a furor over this and they began to demand, not ask, but they began to demand that they remove this right away. Well, Pilate, this man, I gave it away, <laughs> was a military man. And he thought, I'm not going to be cowed by these people. And so he thought if he just sent in enough soldiers, they would be intimidated and back down. To his surprise, he discovered that they were willing to die over this particular thing. And so not wanting to start his governorship with mass bloodshed, he decided, I'll just get rid of these. Now, our story today takes place on Thursday morning. Just if you're interested in history, for a number of years, there was great debate among skeptics and Bible scholars about whether or not Pontius Pilate was ever a real person. Then about, I don't know, 15 years ago in Caesarea, they uncovered a stone. Now, this is not the actual stone. This is a replica of the stone. I couldn't get a picture of the actual stone. But they found this stone that had these little fragments of legible script in it, and they discovered that it said Pontius Pilate, and among other things, it said he was the governor of Judea. So we do know today from archaeology that Pontius Pilate was a real, in fact, person. But as we look at the Bible, now I'm going to put the passages on the screen as we study together today, but I encourage you, there is something to be said for seeing it in the Bible for yourself. Amen? And so, you know, and especially if you have another translation, I'm going to be using the King James, but if you have another translation, sometimes it can shed a little bit of light that's welcome, you know, just a little nuance of, of meaning that you might perceive. But as we go through this story today, I want you to look at your own Bible if you have it. You're welcome to look at the screen as well, but I'm going to invite you to start with me in John chapter 18, and we're looking starting from verse 28. John chapter 18, verse 28 the Bible says, then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was what? Early. Now, we know a lot about the closing scenes of the life of Jesus because John devotes a lot of information, a lot of chapters to like the last four or five days. We don't know exactly when this story takes place, but we assume, we can kind of say 
that it was after midnight, but it was before like the, the you know, like eight o'clock or nine o'clock when life would resume there in the city. Uh, you know, I have read different accounts and everybody kind of pegs this somewhere in the wee hours of the morning. Was it two? Was it four? We don't know exactly, but what we do know is that, was, that it was an, an earthly hour, and the Bible tells us, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they, might, they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Now, here is the irony of what we're looking at. The Jewish leaders brought Jesus that day, and when they brought Jesus, they brought him to what was called in Hebrew, the Lish Kath HaGazid. It was known as the Hall of Hewn Stone. It was what we would call like the, the county courthouse. And that building was connected to the governor's residence. Now, that's a key point because during the Passover uh, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Jews made it a point to purge all of their dwellings and their clothes and possessions of all traces of leaven or yeast. And in so doing, they were very careful with that ceremonial cleansing not to be defiled by those symbols of sin. Now, interestingly, because Pilate was not a Jew, he wouldn't have gone through that process. And as a result of that, the Jews were ceremonially forbidden to enter into the home of a Gentile, and yet they thrust Jesus into that hall of hewn stone for the purpose of, con- of obtaining permission con- to condemn him to death. I want you to come with me now to verse 29. The Bible says, Pilate then went out unto them and said, what accusation bring ye against this man? And in verse 30, they answered and said, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Now, I want you to look at verse 30 for a moment, and I want you to ask yourself the question, What is actually missing from that verse? Is there something missing? There's no evidence. Did you notice that the the Pilate asked, what is the accusation? And what the Jewish leaders basically said in essence was, Pilate, if we, the leaders of this nation, if we bring you someone, it's obvious that he must be guilty. But you know what they didn't say? They didn't give any accusation. And you know why? They deftly avoided answering that. Do you know why? Because the Jews knew that what they were accusing Jesus of was not worthy of capital punishment in a Roman court. And so they knew they had to avoid that. And so they relied on the fact that they were using their influence and authority as leaders bringing this condemned criminal. So Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Now, there, right away it's apparent that they are there that morning for the express purpose of obtaining a warrant for the death of Jesus. Now, I'm going to ask you to come with me down to verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Now, I want you to know a little bit about the time uh, period then. They didn't have Twitter, and there was definitely not Facebook. And they didn't have all of these social media, you know, things that we have today. However, there was definitely the power of word of mouth. And I want you to know that at this point in the ministry of Jesus, everybody in Jerusalem had heard something about Jesus. In fact, if we go through this study a little bit later on, I'm going to show you that there seems to be sufficient evidence that Pilate's wife, remember that young girl, she's a little older now, but that young girl, there is some evidence that not only was she perhaps aware of who Jesus was, there seems to be evidence that she might have been sympathetic, if not a believer in Jesus. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. It's sufficient to say 
that just by living in Jerusalem, Pilate would have heard something about Jesus. And with that background, we come now to verse 34. Now look closely at verse 34. Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Now, I want you to notice that Jesus answered Pilate's question with a question. Did you notice that? Now, don't forget the question. Pilate said, hey, are you the king of the Jews? And then Jesus says to him, Pilate, are you asking that from me because that's what you believe, or is that what they're telling you? Now, one point that I want to stress to you today is that whenever in the Bible God asks a question, it's never because he doesn't know the answer. Amen. In other words, when Jesus asked Pilate this question, it's not because he doesn't know. Remember, let's, let's review. We know, according to Romans, that God has given to every man a measure of what? Faith. Every man has a measure of faith. And where does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing. Pilate had heard about Jesus. And Jesus knew that within Pilate's heart, maybe deep within, he knew that there was this little celestial spark of faith. Maybe his wife had been talking to him about Jesus. We don't know. But what we do know is that Pilate had some faith. And when Jesus asked this question, there was a reason why Jesus was asking, because he wanted Pilate to acknowledge. You see, with mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Does that make sense? And so Jesus wanted Pilate to acknowledge that faith. But when Jesus asked the question, Pilate made a small mistake. I want you to look at verse 35. In verse 35, Pilate answered and said, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Now, you may not recognize the mistake, but it's clear. It's right there. See, Pilate had heard about Jesus. Faith comes by hearing. Every man is given a measure of faith. And when Jesus asked, Jesus wanted Pilate to acknowledge the working of the Holy Spirit in his heart. But when Pilate was given the opportunity, pride rose up. Now, don't miss the irony. Jesus was the prisoner. Pilate was the governor, and he worked hard to get there. And with all of that effort and all of that, that, that cast and all the difference of their, their positions at that point, Pilate could not bring himself to acknowledge the faith that was seated in his mind about the prisoner that was standing before him. I, when I read this, I kind of can perceive the sarcasm and perhaps some of the maybe even prejudice when Pilate says, am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Now, some of you might be wondering, what, what was Pilate's mistake? It's very simple. When the Holy Spirit was speaking to him, he didn't acknowledge or submit to that prompting. That wonderful book, The Desire of Ages, lets us know that this was a small but yet significant step in the downward precipitous path that Pilate was now taking. And I want you to notice that human nature hasn't changed a whole lot. You know, this week we have been looking at the closing scenes of the life of Jesus, and this week we've been talking about the sufferings, the agony, but we've also noticed that all of those experiences that Jesus went through, they have their parallel with God's people again one more time before Jesus comes. And friends, I believe that there have been some of you this week that God's Spirit has spoken to you, not because of me, just because of what the Bible says. I've sat in sermons before, and the Spirit has prompted me to do things that were completely unrelated to what the preacher was talking about. But nevertheless, it was the voice of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes, we're like Pilate. We get proud. We think, you know, I'm a pastor. Or I've been in this church for 35 years. I'm a third-generation Adventist. And you know, when those kinds of things happen... 
we don't realize that the Spirit's speaking to us is the only way that God can convict us of sin. And if we close the door to that, we're left in a dangerous position. Now, I want you to notice that, mercifully, his story doesn't end here. Come with me now to verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Now, do you notice that what Jesus said in verse 36 was enough for Pilate to recognize that Jesus posed no threat to the Roman government? You realize that, right? Because by his own words, what he was saying is, Pilate, my kingdom is not formed by places that have rivers as boundaries and mountains as borders. My kingdom's not even of this world. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now, when this happens, something remarkable takes place. I want you to notice verse 38, one of the most profound passages in the Bible. Pilate said unto him, what did he ask? What did Pilate say? Pilate asked what? What is truth? Do you know that men have wrestled with that question from the beginning of time? Philosophy is devoted to answering that question. What is truth? truth. And you know, Pilate didn't realize it, but that day he was standing in front of the only person who could have ever said, I am the truth. He was standing in front of him right there. So as Pilate is asking this question, he made a second mistake. And you might not see it, but it's right there in verse 38. Now, let me give you a little background so that you understand what's happening. Don't forget, Jesus is inside the Hall of Hewn Stone. Pilate is speaking with Jesus. But right outside the door, you might say in the doorway, those religious leaders were anxiously monitoring the state of affairs of what was going on between Jesus and Pilate. And they began to wonder in amazement as this conversation this non-linear conversation takes these drastic turns to the point that the Roman governor is asking the prisoner, what is truth? And now they got afraid. Now they were concerned because now if Jesus did some miracle or did something or said something and Pilate was convinced, they knew their cause was over. And so those leaders began to create a furor over there. They began to cause a tumult. They began to cavil and and, and, and have all kinds of uh, outbursts. And as they did that, Pilate, in order to deal with the commotion, left Jesus and went out to them. And you know how I know that? Look at the verse carefully. Look at the verse carefully. Pilate said said unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, in other words, to give us the idea that there was no waiting for an answer, as soon as Pilate asked the question, the Bible says that he went out to them and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Now, historians tell us that when a Roman official presided over a court, as they sat in their chair, there was a phrase that they used to indicate that the defendant was innocent, and that phrase was absolvo. Now, I don't think that that's exactly what Pilate said, but it's clear that Pilate told the Jews that Jesus, in his estimation, was innocent. I want to ask you a simple question. Don't overthink this. Based on what Pilate had said, what should he have done? He should have let Jesus go, right? He should have let Jesus go. But you see, Pilate had made a second mistake on this interaction with Jesus. And let me tell you something. I see this all the time. 
You know, most evangelistic meetings are about 24 topics, and they're pretty, they're pretty orderly. Like, they go in a fashion that's logical. You know, they present the law, then the Sabbath, and so forth. And when you do this, it is uncanny to me. It is almost, uh, it's a supernatural phenomenon. There are some nights that are absolutely imperative that people hear. And I find that those nights, those critical nights, people will not show up. They've been coming every night, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. And the next day, I say, hey, by the way, where were you? We missed you. And they say something like this. And I hear this over and over. And they say, oh, you know, it's the weirdest thing. My boss never asks me to work overtime. But then yesterday, he said, I need you to work overtime. And I couldn't come. I've had people say, you know, it was weird. Like, my family just... I had family from out of town. They came unannounced. And I had to stay home and I had to be with them. You know, the devil knows that you have a chance to hear truth. Isn't that right? And the devil is not going to sit by and just hope that you're going to be enlightened and change your life and shake off the shackles of sin. So the devil wants to keep you from hearing those kinds of things. And let me tell you, folks, this happens a lot today. Now, some of us, we don't even ask the question. We just dive right into the distractions. And I mentioned this earlier, but if you did a survey of of my church members, I would say that the majority of them have an unlimited subscription to Netflix, and boy, do they use it. And I want to tell you, I'm just being honest with you, I believe that the devil with great success uses these distractions to keep us from dealing with the real issues about life and death and your salvation. Because sometimes we'd rather just zone out and escape into a pleasant, humdrum life watching programs that we're not even interested in. We just don't want to think about the difficulties of life. I've been there, how about you? (laughs) And let me tell you, folks, when the devil does that, when he distracts us, I've told people, there is some message in this seminar that you absolutely cannot miss, and there's going to come up an obstacle that seems like it's insurmountable, and when it comes, I want you to know, that's the subject that you have to be here for. Now, when Pilate did that, he was looking to get Jesus free. Come with me now to Luke 23, and I want to show you something that the Gospel of John does not record, but Luke does. And in Luke 23, we start in verse 5. And by the way, if you read verse 4, that's the carryover from where we left off in John 18. But now in verse 5, They were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Now, I want to ask you a question. We just read this, but did you notice that just in the previous verse, he had said to the Jewish leaders, he said, I find in him no what? The fault. In other words, he's innocent. What should he have done? He should have let him go. But you know, it's interesting because Pilate heard something. He said, wait, wait a minute. Did you just say that he's from Galilee? Is that what I heard you say? Did you just say that? Oh, guess what? This isn't my problem. This is Herod's problem. And you know what he thought? I think he thought, okay, I'm being smart. But he made a third mistake. It's significant. You know what his third mistake was? He put off doing what was right. You see, he knew that Jesus was innocent. But he knew that if he did that, it would have political repercussions. And because he didn't want to make the hard decision, he sent him to Herod to avoid doing what he knew he was supposed to do. Now, I want to tell you, folks, I want to tell you that I have met 
the same spirit that Pilate had in my travels around the world. Almost every seminar that I conduct, we, I should say every seminar that we conduct, we invite people to make decisions to follow truth. And when we do that, I've observed that whenever you invite people to do something to follow truth, the devil always tries to encourage or, or to, to instigate people to put off making the right decision. You know, when you invite someone to baptism, baptism is clear. Jesus was baptized. He set us an example. And baptism is not a graduation. It's really the beginning of your walk with Christ. You're telling people, hey, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow his truths. Amen? But you'd be amazed. You invite people to do what Jesus did. You invite people to follow the example of Jesus. And when you do that, there are so many people that say, yeah, you know what? Like, I, I, I know I should do it. I want to do it, but I just can't do it right now. And I've seen this again and again and again. Folks, when you have the impression of the Spirit to do something in your life, if you can learn anything from Pilate today, it's this. When you know what God wants you to do, don't avoid doing what God wants you to do. Do it now. Do it while you still have strength. Do it while you still have life. Because you never know if that chance to do it will ever come back to you again. You just don't know. Pilate thought, hey, I'm being smart. Come with me to Luke 23, verse 8. Now, this is an interesting turn in the story. When Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season. Now, the Herod that we're talking about here is the same Herod that put John the Baptist to death. Same one. Not a good guy. And give me a little background. Herod used to like John the Baptist. In fact, the Bible says he heard him gladly. What's interesting is that one day John had a sermon where he said, listen, that woman that you're with, you can't have her. And he was right, John was right to say that because Herod's mistress was his brother's wife. And not only that, she was his cousin. So it was wrong on a number of counts. And when John said that, uh, Uh, Herodias knew her days were numbered if John kept preaching like this. So she enlisted the help of her daughter, and that daughter seduced these revelers, and Herod made a promise and an oath, and in so doing, he ultimately killed John the Baptist. You know, when we have light and we sin against it, Heaven doesn't usually give us more light unless we're willing to follow what we've already had. And what's interesting is that when Jesus comes before Herod, now please notice uh, the last part of verse 8, because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Verse 9, then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Now, I want to make this point clear. Jesus had nothing against speaking to rulers. But you have to understand that Herod was someone that had had great opportunities by hearing John the Baptist. And when Jesus was brought before him, Jesus could have probably said something that would have kept Herod awake for the next few months. But he didn't. In fact, I think that Jesus gave him the most solemn rebuke that heaven could ever give. You see, heaven had nothing to say to him anymore because he had already rejected the truths that God had revealed to him by now. There are some of you here today that may have been in the church for decades. And it may be that after all these years, your knowledge is still pretty much in the same place. Oh, you've been to Sabbath school, and you've heard some sermons, and you've watched 3ABN. But maybe, maybe your experience hasn't grown because you haven't been willing to live up to the light 
that God's already given you. Herod had no words from Jesus. I want you to notice verse 10, and the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe. And then what did they do? They sent him again to who? To Pilate. Now, when I read that, I thought to myself, you know, Pilate probably thought, oh, I've washed my hands of this. He sent to Herod. I don't have to deal with it. I'm going to go back to sleep. And by the way, just so that you know, Herod's palace and Pilate's, go- the, the hall of, uh, of the governor, like the hall of Hewn Stone, they were just like a few city blocks apart. So it's not like Jesus had this long journey. It was just a few city blocks. And so when Jesus gets ba- sent back, now I think panic begins to set in for Pilate. This is when I think Pilate begins to be concerned that this mess is not going to go away. Verse 13, And Pilate, when he had called it together the chief priests and the rules of the people, he said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found what? No fault in this man touching those things wherever you accuse him. Verse 15, No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Verse 16, I will therefore what? Chastise him and release him. Now, if you're counting, how many times has Pilate said with his own lips that Jesus was innocent? How many times? Twice. And then he says, and even Herod said he's innocent, right? Now, what's, what's tragic is what he says in verse 16. He says, I will therefore what? Chastise him. Let me tell you what this meant. In English, the word chastise, you think of like a spanking, but no. The word chastise, what Pilate was inferring here was they would strip the prisoner naked to his waist. And by the way, I'm not advising you to do this, but the movie The Passion of the Christ, it historically, historically accurately depicts this very thing. They would strip the prisoner naked to his waist, and they had those Roman pillars. They would tie him around one of the, the pillars, and they had a guy that was dedicated just for this thing. He was called a carnifex. Think of the biggest guy that you know. And he had a special tool. It was called the whip. Scholars are not agreed, but some say that the whip had 13 leather strands on the end. And in his free time, he would tie little pieces of bone and metal. And when that carnifex took that whip, and as he unleashed it on the prisoner, when he pulled on it, all those, those strands would dissect the back of the prisoner. And some of you know that when Jesus was on the cross, he, he asked for water. It's likely that he was suffering from an infection. They didn't dis- disinfect these whips. And from the blood loss and from the infection, probably, you know, fever set in and, you know, the body trying to fight the infection. So it's clear that and, and by the way, like the Romans, they were experts at the art of torture. They had discovered over some course of time that if you beat a man 40 times, he will die. So they only beat the prisoners 39 times. In other words, Jesus was beat within an inch of his life. And you have to ask yourself, why did Pilate do this? Now, I don't know if you realize what Pilate was doing. He said Jesus was innocent twice, and Herod even acknowledged his innocence. But Pilate knew that those priests wanted blood. And in an effort to please those leaders, Pilate beat Jesus 39 times. You know, every person at some point in their life tries to please people. And that's not wrong. What's wrong is when you try to please people in conflict with trying to please God. And you would be amazed. Like, I had a seminar in Kansas, and I had a woman coming. Her name was Darlene. And when Darlene came, I visited her one day at her home, and I said, Darlene, have you enjoyed the seminar? She said, I loved it. I said, 
Darlene, tell me, what's new for you? She said, wow, I've learned about the Sabbath. That's new. I said, Darlene, what, what are you going to do about it? She said, you know, I would keep the Sabbath, but I'm afraid that if I join your church, my children won't let me be involved in help raising my grandchildren, because I think that they'll think that your church is weird. Now, I want to tell you something. The Bible is clear. If a man's ways please the Lord, it makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. But most people don't think like that. Most people, they don't have the faith to trust that if I do what's right, people are going to respect me even if they don't like me. And the problem is that Pilate, he knew Jesus was innocent, but he wanted to make those leaders happy. You know, I believe there are people here today that are doing the same thing. You know, sometimes, and I've seen this happen on multiple occasions, sometimes people will say things like this. They'll say, you know what? I know that he's not a Christian, but I think that if we get married, I think he'll start coming to church with me. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you, the Bible is clear. Don't be unequally yoked. And the truth is that sometimes we gloss over those things, and really when you, when you distill it down to its essence, what you're doing is you're trying to make someone happy rather than God. That's really what it is. When Pilate did that, he made a critical mistake. Now, come back to the Gospel of John, and we'll finish up here this afternoon. John chapter 18 and I want to ask you to look with me starting in verse 39. Now, this is where Pilate's desperation begins to show. He said, but you have a custom. Now, remember, the Passover was like July 4 for the Jews. It was Independence Day. It's when they got released out of Egypt. And so when Pilate has this festive occasion where Jews from all over the world come congregate on Jerusalem, he wants to make them happy. And he remembers, maybe he didn't start it, but there was a custom, you grant pardon to one of the prisoners. And he thinks, I should do this. And so he decides, in verse 39, that I should release unto you one of the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now, if you read the other gospel accounts, Pilate had in his prison, in one of those dungeons, he had one of the most dangerous rabble rousers, one of the most uh, dangerous criminals, and his name was Barabbas. And Pilate, I think, tried to play up on human nature. Because what he was doing was offering them a choice between a known convict, a murderer, and Jesus. Jesus who had healed, Jesus who had fed the people, Jesus who had taught, Jesus who had raised the dead, the, the loving, kind, gentle Jesus. And Pilate just thought, huh, if I do this, they're going to be the ones to choose Jesus. But you know what happened? He didn't realize that there were people there that day that would rather die than see Jesus go free. And the Bible says to Pilate's surprise in verse 40, then cried they all again saying, not this man, but who? Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Now I know that you've, you've been noting with me this week that everything in these closing scenes have a parallel to the end of time in God's people and their experience at the very end. Now, the name Barabbas is from two words. The, the prefix bar, it means the son of, like Barnabas. He's the son of consolation. And Abba is father. So Barabbas means the son of the father. That day, that crowd, that multitude was being offered a choice by the corrupt power of the state to choose between two people who claimed to be the son of the father. And guess who they chose? They chose the false one. And that's going to happen one more time before Jesus comes. Now, remember that young wife? This is in Matthew 27. You don't have to turn there because we're going to go right back to John. But notice what that young wife, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him saying, 
have thou nothing to do with that what? Just. In other words, even if we can't make any other conclusions, we could conclusively say that her name was, um, what was her name again? Oh, I forgot it. But anyway, <laughs> he, his wife says that she believed that he was a just man. Just means what? Righteous, right? But notice what else she said, and this is where I think she might have been a believer. She said, for I have suffered many things this day in a what? A dream because of him. Now, let me see if I can explain that. Let me unpack that just a little bit. Let's suppose, and you shouldn't, but let's suppose you had someone you didn't like. And one day you have a dream, and in that dream, this person gets beaten and tortured and then ultimately put to an ignominious death. If you were not a good person, you might enjoy that dream. But if that person was someone that you loved, if you saw those things happening to them, what would happen to you? You would hurt, right? It would hurt you. And folks, do you see? When she saw what Jesus suffered in her dream, it says that she suffered. She must have loved Jesus. And let me tell you, when Pilate got this message from his wife, I'm sure that he was racking his brain trying to figure out how he could keep his job and still do what was right. Now, Pilate's decision was another tragic step in his ultimate demise. Because he thought, I'm not going to decide. I'm going to let you guys decide. You know what? People still do that. I have people come to me and say, preacher, I'm going to get baptized if my girlfriend gets baptized. You know, if you ever leave a decision to someone else, Satan will make sure that that other person makes the wrong decision. I'm serious. I've seen this happen again and again. If you decide I'll do it if my parents do it or if my kids do it or whatever, almost without fail, the devil will work overtime to make sure that that person makes the wrong decision. And so now Pilate, in desperation, John chapter 19, he took Jesus and he scourged him. And the Bible says in verse 2, and they, the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find what? No, how many times now? Three times. Then Jesus came forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto them, now notice these words, he said, Behold the man. In Latin, he would have said ecce homo, which means look at him, look at the man. Now, the reason I'm sharing that, that's the title of a famous painting. And you know what Pilate was trying to do? He was thinking that if they saw him bleeding, if they saw the rivulets of blood that were running down his face, the bruised back, if they saw these things, that maybe someone would have compassion and say, okay, that's enough, let him go. But lo and behold, there were in that day people and perhaps beings that were unwilling to let that happen. Now in verse 6, and as soon as he had said unto them, I am he. No, I'm sorry, that's wrong, verse 6. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. That's the fourth time. The Jews answered him, we have a law and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the what? Son of God. Now, let me tell you, folks, you have to know a little background about Roman religion. The Romans worshipped multiple gods, but they believed that from time to time the gods would come down in human form, and the purpose of that was to see if the affairs of men were being handled judiciously, like fairly. Kind of like our Santa Claus myth, that, and the idea that, you know, he's seeing if you're good, you're naughty, you're nice, right? Well, in that mindset... 
the Romans had this belief that the gods would come down. Now notice, for the first time, they never said this before. They told Pilate, Pilate, we have to have him killed because he thinks that he's the son of God. Now notice what Pilate said now. When Pilate therefore heard what? That saying. Now don't miss, what was the saying that he made himself the son of God? I want you to look with me at the next verse. He was the more afraid. And he went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, what did he ask? Whence art thou? Can someone translate, what does whence art thou mean? Where are you from? Now, folks, let me tell you, he wasn't asking if he was from Galilee. He already knew that. What he's asking is, hey, what planet are you from? I mean, no, really, that's what he was asking now. He was asking, hey, where is the dwelling, the, you know, where, where beyond the stars do you live? That's what he was asking. Because now we heard that this guy claimed that he was the son of God. Pilate said unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest not thou that I have power to crucify thee, I have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered thee, me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. A little background. Pilate was not a honest man. History says that he had signed innocent people to death to further his political aims. And so he was under corruption investigation. He had, was facing corruption charges. And when the Jews said, Pilate, if you let him go, we're going to report you to Caesar, Pilate made a decision. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, what saying? If you do this, you're not Caesar's friend. Pilate reasoned like this. If it's a choice between my job and this guy, this guy has to go. If it's a choice between me losing my job and him, the prisoner has to go. I'm going to skip down to verse 16. Then delivered he him, ther him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. You know what Pilate's mistake was? He said, you know what? I can't lose my job. How am I going to survive? I got to get rid of Jesus. You know, there, you would be amazed at how many people look at their job as the most important thing in their lives. They think, you know, if I keep the Sabbath and I lose my, how am I going to eat? Jesus said, him that honoreth me, or I'm sorry, the Bible says, him that honoreth me, him will I honor. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I have been young and now I'm old, but I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Will God take care of you if you're faithful? He will, but you have to trust him. Pilate didn't think that God could take care of him if he lost his job. Well, interestingly enough, Pilate's story ends quite tragically. I'm going to put this on the screen for you today. We're going to sing our closing hymn, and as we do that, I'm going to make a simple invitation before we pray. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you to look with me at two more verses. This is in Matthew 27. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. How many times have you seen people do that? They know what they should do, but they know that if they do that, it's going to be a, there's going to be some problems. And so they say, you know what? I can't do this, but they try to compensate for it in some other way. They figuratively wash their hands. I had a woman coming to my seminar in Virginia. She was an accountant, and she learned about the Sabbath. She believed it. She could see it was from the Bible. When I asked her what she would do, she wouldn't answer the question. She wouldn't respond. <laughs> But that day, that meeting, she left and she wrote me a personal check for $1,200. I never saw her again. I think she thought that she was washing her hands. If she gave me a gift, this would lessen her obligation to God. People do all kinds of strange things to escape conviction. I'm going to ask you to take your hymnals and we're going to sing our closing hymn.